The following is a Coin TV special presentation. Billy Rancher! All right, this one's called Rocky Road. I want to dedicate to love song. Dedicate to Karen right now. All right. Well, well, I'm walking down a rocky road for you. I don't think I've ever met in all my life anybody that enjoyed life more than Billy Rancher. This was a great loss for life. Life is such a mystery, yeah. He was a, a real jokester. He was just a, a rascal. <laughs> I think Billy was given a really hard road in life, a real challenge and a real test, and I think he passed it with flying colors. A little background on me, uh, I was born in Los Angeles, moved uh, to Alaska, lived in Alaska for 12 years. 1970, moved from Alaska to Portland, Oregon, where I was a baseball player. I loved sports, I loved the outdoors, I loved fishing. After high school, I had a scholarship to play baseball, and I went to college for a year and a half and somehow I picked up a, a guitar my sophomore year in college and became fascinated with music. Um, I had no musical background, but somehow I became a really uh, a songwriter and uh, started one band with a, a group of friends. It was called the Mal Chicks. Uh, my brother was in the band. My brother's a musician, the piper in the band. He's such a fine composer, the best in all the land. Me and Bill, we just, we loved it because we could play for a living, finally, you know. It's like, we didn't even think, you know, music was supposed to be for money. And uh, we just had fun playing together. He was such a crazy guy on stage, you know. <laughs> Billy Lenny and the Malchicks, I believe it was 1981, split the band up. And uh, Billy went on his own at that time and formed Billy Rancher and the Unreal Gods. And I remember distinctly that if, uh, if you wanted to dance, everybody knew where to go. guitar player for the band, John Dufresne, Alf Ryder, where's David? Dave Stricker, the bass player, and... Okay, this is David, slide in, and Dave Stricker, and Billy Flaxel, the drummer here. The Unreal Gods, the best band in Northwest Portland. about the whole Billy Rancher and the Unreal Gods band was, I mean, we got to experience a, a side of life that I don't think many people get to experience, maybe bar, I mean, this might sound weird, but bar like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, we got to experience the ultimate in um, audience appreciation. Billy was very important because he came at a time when uh, the people who didn't want to believe that Portland was a real 
original music community were saying, well, okay, all the good bands got signed. Johnny and the Distractions are on a and Seafood Mama's now Quarter Flash are on Geffen. Who's next? And Billy Rancher said, I'm next. It's towards the end of that summer that Billy first found out he had cancer. And you know, of course, that was pretty devastating because here we all, all were just, you know, feeling like we were on the brink of success. And then, you know, the main guy comes down with cancer. And it was, it was pretty shocking. I got over it really quickly. I had a real extensive operation, an eight-hour operation. To, I was a search for any additional traces of cancer. It was just a exploratory surgery real risky one but they wanted to do it to find any more traces of cancer and they did the operation cut me in half practically and uh turned out test results really good Is it fantasy or nightmare? I, can't really tell the difference. I was really surprised at how fast billy popped back i mean it was like you know all of a sudden two weeks later out of the hospital he's you know breaking down the door wanting to jam and writing tunes and you know God, who could even keep up with him there for a while Come on now, baby. If my love together. people loved his songs they loved his songs they could dance to them they could remember them they liked the words they loved the fact that he was in love with a beautiful girl because he made I think Karen's got a very vivid memory on how we met. It was at a midnight movie at Fifth Avenue Cinema, and we walked over there to get in line with them and talk to them, and it was love at first sight. Yeah, it was. The first time I saw her eyes, um, they're green, aren't they? <laughs> oh, you care. Uh, oops, I fell in love with her. Come on, come on, stick together. Because we made a vow to love. Billy and the band were at the height of their power, I think, was in 1983. No one doubted that they were on their way to stardom. They'd recorded some songs in New York. A uh, major L.A. label had signed them to a very good contract, and things were definitely on the road to uh, success. The police told me. The police told me. It seemed like everything was really clicking for them. So once again, you know, he, he was down in L.A., and he got... He wasn't feeling very well, and uh, it was just another indication that he's, he's ready to go for another bout with his illness, which what it turned out to be. He came back up and contacted the, the surgeon who had done the original cancer surgery, and it was found that uh, he had metastatic cancer pretty severely. It wrapped around his aorta, and he required an aortic graft, a Dacron graft, to replace his natural aorta because the cancer had invaded that tissue, and there was a danger of his aorta bursting. Also, he received chemotherapy at that time. Um, once you find out, the first uh, thing you have to deal with is fear, and mixed with a little bit of depression. The more time you dwell on, on something such as fear, the more damage it does to you in the long run, both mentally and physically. You gotta try to use humor and, and faith to overcome it. If you wanna talk about hard times, I think cancer was really only the beginning. The record company canceled out Billy and the band once that they heard he had a recurrence, and the band was under an incredible amount of pressure. I think that they all felt at this time that the big time had passed them by. The band, the Unreal Gods, again broke up, and at this time, I believe they were all pretty much broke, just waiting for Billy to get well again. The one thing that helped me was concentrating on love. You have to realize how fortunate you are even when you're at a position where you might uh, try to drown yourself in self-pity because uh, for every person who's, who has a dilemma or a, or a bad problem, there's somebody who's got a similar problem or, or something 
They could be considered worse. Cancer changed Billy. He wasn't the same Billy Rancher before cancer struck him. I, that's, that's uh, one thing. He was a great man before he had cancer, don't get me wrong, but after he got the cancer, he, he became more aware of other people's hardships, everything. He wanted to help other people and, he, and to forget about his cancer. He wanted to just help other people. I was um, telling Billy that uh, the, the mistreatment of people in South Africa was like uh, a cancerous sore that uh, we need to rectify in order for the world to go on and grow. And Billy you know, sort of understood that, and it, it came out through his song. We had gone for maximum success, and I think Billy found that that wasn't really what he wanted. I think he wanted a more personal form of communication in music. I finished that five-song EP, Thinking Zebra, while I was in the hospital the second time, and that was a very strong inspiration to get me through the, some of the rougher moments while I was in the hospital. When he got well enough uh, to put something else together, he put together a reggae thing, uh, Flesh and Blood, and that, I really loved that band. That band was just great to see. What Bill did was he just, uh, he told us, hey, we're gonna practice five times a week, uh, you know, every, every day, and we're gonna try to just make this band into a, a, a feasible thing, and, and he did it. And he did it with a, a brashness that Billy Ranch was, you know, he's the only one that could do it that way, you know, my brother. And he, you know, same way he used to bust my head when I was a kid, you know? It looked like Billy was unsinkable. Two bands down, uh, two bouts with cancer, but still the ranch uh, kept his optimism and he started caring a little bit more about his health at this time. Uh, took himself out of the fast lane as far as rock and rollers go, uh, put every ounce of energy that he possibly could muster up into his new band. One run though, we got one. That phase of Billy lasted for maybe six months before again he his illness started to show its ugly face on him again. Again, he had to go into taking care of his physical needs, so Flesh and Blood was put on hold because Billy had to go for that extreme treatment plan again. Prior to going into the hospital the last time, I hadn't slept for three weeks because of the pain. I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. Three weeks of no pain, my friends took me to the hospital. Dr. Kimberly and Mr. Fritz Johnson forced me to go to the hospital, and I went to the hospital. And first hour I was there, I got an injection of heroin, and I fell into the deepest sleep I've ever felt. When it, and then I, then I proceeded for the next four months, every four hours, to get an injection, which overtoxified my whole system. I became very addicted. I went through two weeks of withdrawal symptoms. It becomes a real monster. Until three years ago, I was just like you. Talking for fun, a romancer. Until the day the doctors on this would say, so straightforwardly, I had cancer. My aunt arms and legs are numb from the chemotherapy, which was another drug that I had for the cancer. It takes an awful lot of uh, mental blocking out. My ears are ringing 24 hours a day, like two 747 jets are taking off, like. Chemotherapy. 
Admittedly, I don't think I would have been as strong as him because I never saw the guy gripe, ever. I went everywhere I went with him, never did he complain. So it's a game, it's just a game for me and you. Making a triumph from disaster. And I even asked him on a certain occasion when we did go fishing, I'm saying, Ranch, tell me, were you just as a pal? What goes through your mind? What is going through your mind? He says, to be honest with you, Glenn, I am scared to death 24 hours a day. I feel that there are moments when you, you have to admit despair and fear um, because you're only human. But uh, the main thing is to never let it overcome you completely. You've got to have that, that strength and you've got to hang in there when, they're going, when it really gets tough. The cancer specialist working with him at that time said, Billy, I, I really don't think there's much more we can do for you. He still had cancers in his liver the size of a large softball. So he was discharged from chemotherapy because the cancer specialist felt that he still had active tumor and that uh, he would have about three months to live. What is conquering a disease? Well, it might be living six months when the doctor says you only have one month to live. By Billy's standards, he thought that he had uh, conquered cancer again because it was nine months later, uh, the cancer had shrunk, and uh, this time he and Karen were planning to get married. And when she comes home from a long day on the town and I'm, I'm here making music, we come in and we hold each other, and it's like the first day we met, you know? It's like there hasn't really been any changes in that department. And we are getting married. Uh, April 25th, uh, 1986, on a Saturday at St. Mary's Cathedral, big church in Portland, Oregon. What's the date? April 25th, 1986. Seven. 1987, I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, she'd love that. Whoops, wrong I didn't stay there with Billy every night and, and cry with Billy every day because I don't think Billy wanted me to be that way. So I, you know, I've got to just take my hat off to my mom and Karen. The good side of it is that I'm spending more time with my mom and I'm learning about her and she's learning about me. And if you look upon the whole cancer issue as a learning experience, that, that makes it more bearable. And I don't think the Billy Rancher ever looked in his mother's eyes and saw worry. I think he saw strength, strength, uh, a nonverbal strength. Just there was a look in her eye when she looked at her son, saying, uh, uh, "Only you can do it, Billy, and I know you can do it, Billy. I know you can do it, Billy, and I'm here to help you. That's all I'm for is here to help you." They were a combo, those two. You take every day as it comes, and you're very grateful for the moments you do have, and uh, you know you do appreciate. It's at the time you spend with your loved ones and the, the wisdom that you, you gain, you know, just from being alive. And it's, it, it really, uh, I think it's bolstered my IQ a little bit. I mean, it hasn't made me a physicist or anything, but maybe a little bit of a, I don't know, sidewalk philosopher. Music has been something that's, uh, help pull me through and give me something to look forward to. Stepping on the stage is uh, an inspirational point to feel that you can play your art. The satisfaction is, is tremendous just to have people in attendance and if they appreciate you, that's even better. I kept calling him and we were talking on the phone. I said, God, you gotta come over here and, and listen to this stuff. There's a way for you to make music even though your hands are numb and your feet are numb and your equilibrium's a little shot. Um, there's a way you can do it. Um, even if you don't want to sing, you can rap. This, we can do it. Um, we've got a drum machine. I'll play the music. I'll do whatever you want to do. Let's see what we can do. Billy started writing new music with his friends besides coaching a brand new band here in Portland. Uh, and he gave himself only three weeks to completely write a brand new album. 
and he did it from his bedside. I think at this time, uh, Billy really felt that his time was up, but uh, none of us knew that. We'd work 12 hours a day, most every day, and um, Billy's energy was just so inf infectious that, um, you know, I'd find myself, um, you know, working the 12 to 14 hours there recording and just not really feeling like I'd worked more than two hours because uh, Billy would give back a lot more, you know, than it, it seemed like he was capable of, of giving. I think the underlying um, motive for his drive was that he wanted music out for posterity. He also knew he had a lot of music in him and he wanted to get that out and get that documented, get it on tape anywhere. We did finish this recording project. In three weeks' time, we recorded, mixed, duplicated, and released a 15-song cassette of Billy's songs. And um, Billy put so much of his heart and his soul into these songs. It was really when he started working so hard a period of three months ago when he decided to resume his musical career that the cancer recurred. I think one of my biggest mistakes dealing with cancer in the past is that I just get out of the operate, operating room and I come right back out a month later, two weeks later, into the same environment. And uh, I think history has shown that that theory of re rehabilitation isn't quite working. A history of, of hardship that he had endured um, taught him to um, a greater love for people. And I think in the early days he wanted just to be a star, but um, later he wanted to be a star with something to say, with something to give the world. All I can say, welcome back, Billy Ramsey. Once again, Billy tried getting on the stage. He called himself Mr. Groove, which was the title of a nice little cassette he put out. He thought he could start performing again. Unfortunately, this phase didn't last very long. Make Love Not War was Billy's last audio recording as well as visual recording. A home video made of it is the last anybody ever taped of Billy. And when they ask me, Daddy, what is war? What is crime? What is nuclear bombs for? I shake my head. I say, I say, make love not war. Life is worth living, and you, you know, if you, if you choose to live, you got to accept what, what's around you, and you have to, uh, Allow love to come in and, and come into your mind, come into your heart and your soul. It's easy to forget about love, but uh, that would have to be the most important thing to realize. I said, I want to know what's going through your mind. Uh, where are you right now? What do you got going through your mind? Um, and he said, to be honest with you, I'm ready to go. He said, my bags are packed, I've got my life in order, I'm ready to go. He said, Glenn, I'm tired of the pain. And just before he did die, he looked up in my eyes and he said, Glenn, they can't say the ranch didn't try, can they? And I said, no, Billy, they can't. But in the big picture, when there are no problems, there's only love, there's no jealousy, there's only love. Uh, Lenny and I, we would uh, be left with Billy as a babysitter, and he would have the gall to uh, pretend he was a being from another world. And <laughs> he would pretend he was this thing from above <laughs> and from Mars named Bali. What he would do is he would snap out of himself, completely change his face, 
uh, almost like looking like a statue and, and say, I'm not Billy, I'm Bali. We couldn't believe it, you know, he'd turn into Bali. So he'd be Billy one time and then Bali, and then it was just like a, a total dichotomy right there. He'd go, no, you're Billy. And he'd go, no, I'm Bali. And uh, he'd have us believe it. He was a great actor, even at the age of 12. It was <laughs> we would just, we wouldn't understand it. Uh-oh, Billy's into Bali again, you know. He'd get us to the point where we were crying for our brother. You know? <laughs> we want Billy back. The guy was kind of possessed. <laughs> That's about it, really. He was just uh, a rascal. <laughs> Thank you.